All right, tonight's question is, are there two separate judgments and who will be involved in each? So we, this piggybacked off a question from a couple weeks ago and I, I don't remember exactly what the question was at that point, but uh, we were talking about the judgment seat of Christ and how believers would be judged and then, uh, then a di another judgment or a different judgment uh, for unbelievers. And we talked some then about how, uh, I, I think I presented the view that I thought there would be two separate judgments that were described, that the judgment in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 was different than the judgment of Revelation chapter 20, that those were separate judgments perhaps taking place at different times, certainly different subjects of the judgment with the 2 Corinthians judgment being believers and the Revelation 20 passage being unbelievers. So let's... Uh, let's Think about this a little bit. Are there two separate judgments, and who will be involved in each? So, let's see some passages about the final judgment. First of all, one of the probably the longest and most extensive is in Matthew chapter 25, and this is the sheep and the goats. Uh, kind of a long passage. We won't read the whole thing. Let me go through and hit a few highlights. Uh, Matthew 25. Begin in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. So this is about the second coming. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. The king will say to those on his right, who are the sheep, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. And then the, skip down to verse 37. The righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry? And when did we see you as a stranger? And then verse 40, the king will reply, I tell you the truth. I, truly, I tell you, whatever you did one, for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, these are the goats. Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. They will answer, Lord, when did we see you? This is 44. 45. He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. <coughs> then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So, passage talking about eternal torment, eternal punishment uh, for the goats that are on his uh, right, and then his sheep who are on the uh, no, goats are on the left. Sheep are on the right. They are going away to everlasting life. Vivid picture of judgment uh, probably draws on the uh, prophecy of Joel about the uh, time of judgment in uh, Joel chapter 2, I believe, is where that is. So, big passage on judgment there. Matthew 13, we talked about this one a lot last week with religious liberty, the parable of the weeds. And the weeds are growing up along with the wheat. And the disciples want to go in and pull the weeds up. And Jesus says, nope, don't pull them up right now. Leave the weeds in there, and I'll sort them out at the end. Talked about how that was a parable uh, that speaks strongly to the idea of religious liberty and the fact that we are not supposed to uh, try to uproot uh, people who are not believers, people who are weeds, here in this life. We're to leave that uh, to God to do and allow him to be the Lord of conscience and people to make their own decisions. So, another strong judgment passage there. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 5. Let's look at that one together. And I'll get a volunteer to read that. 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 5. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. All right, so there we have fascinating uh, pa passage there about judgment. Paul says, no human court is going to be my judge. Even I don't even try to judge myself, but God is the only one who's going to judge. He says, my conscience is clear. What does he say after he says, my conscience is clear? But that does not make me innocent. That does not make me innocent. That's a, that is a really cool uh, turn and a really cool dynamic there for our day and age. 
Because people today say, hey, my conscience is clear about that. I, like, I've got nothing to worry about. Paul said, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. God's still going to judge. He's still going to tell me if it's right or wrong, whether my conscience is clear or not. But his idea, the idea is that God is going to judge. And what does he say after that in verse 5? Judge nothing before the appointed time and to wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. And at that time, each will receive their praise from God. So this is another passage about judgment. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Well, is that last one just for believers? Because unbelievers certainly won't receive praise from God. We'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, check, uh, verse 10. This is the verse that we had talked about some a few weeks ago. Somebody want to read that for us? 5, 10. For we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So we, we must all, and this one is clearly in the context of believers, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so we're going to receive uh, what is due for us, uh, for what we've done in the body, good or bad. All right, so clear statement of judgment that believers are going to face. Then you have the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20. So turn there almost to the very end of your Bible. <laughs> Revelation 20. There's no pass on that. It's Revelation. Revelation 20. Beginning in verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So that is definitely an end times judgment of the unbelievers clearly are included in that. Uh, is that more along, I mean, could that be the sheep and the goats at that point in time? Well, that's kind of the question for tonight, oh, okay. for tonight, is are all these talking about the same judgment, or are there two separate judgments? Now, I had, I told you guys when we were going through our end time study that I grew up kind of from the dispensationalist perspective, and I had always been taught that there were two separate judgments, that there was going to be a, a judgment seat of Christ where believers were going to be judged and they were going to receive reward for what they did, but then at a separate time, there was going to be this Revelation 20 Great White Throne Judgment. And that was the paradigm that I had worked on and just kind of assumed in my own mind and thought and even talked about it a few weeks ago that, uh, that I believe this, this was what was going to happen. Now, because of this question, I looked up uh, in Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. I, I was like, okay, let's lay out what, the judgment, what judgments occur when and what passages talk about which. So he talked about this a little bit, and he made the argument that there is actually only one judgment, that all of these are actually referring to the same, uh, the same judgment. And a as I read that, I realized, you know, that idea that the judgments were separate is something that I hadn't really thought about or studied. I didn't really hold it for a particular reason. It was just kind of what I had always heard growing up, and I just kind of assumed that that was the case. But when he laid that out and he said, no, it seems more likely that all of these are talking about the same. There's one judgment that takes place for all of these things. And he laid out exactly what was going to happen there. And I've got it up here for you. So this is coming from Grudem's theology. Uh, at this judgment, Jesus will be the judge. Unbelievers will be judged. We see that clearly in some of the passages. Believers will be judged. Also, angels will be judged. We talked about that a few weeks ago, right? Probably that was the con that was probably the question yeah. that brought this up. Do we judge the angels? Yeah, and we will help in the work of judgment. We, should, we talked about that when we talked about the angel judgment. That's, it's all coming back to me now. So unbelievers will be judged. Believers will be judged. Both of these happening at the same judgment, according to Grudem. And I, I didn't. Nothing came to my mind to argue with with him that these were all one judgment. Uh, so, like I said, this is. Uh, this has been something that even just today while I was studying this, I, my thinking on this said, you know what, I think this is, this is probably right. This sounds better to me. 
Now, it could be that if, if I were to do a more in-depth study of this, spend a couple days or a couple weeks on it, I might come to a different conclusion than that, but I'm, I'm usually pretty comfortable if, if Wayne Grudem says that I, I put a lot of stock in it, so he's done a lot of research. I'm gonna go with, I'm, this is the one I'm most comfortable with at this point, and I think this is probably the good answer. So the question is, what happens, Does do these look the same? And I still think there's a difference in what the judgment we face looks like. We won't face a judgment where uh, all of our sins are being brought up and we're, we're seeing all the things that we did, all the terrible things that we did, and we're uh, receiving condemnation and, and shame and guilt being poured out on us at the judgment. Unbelievers, I believe, will, will experience that. I believe our judgment will not be one of, oh, your sins were so bad. Our judgment will be an evaluation of motives and works, and did you do what you were called to do by Jesus' commands? Your sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus, but now you're being judged and you're seeing how much reward you will receive. Unbelievers who uh, sin a little will be judged a little. Unbelievers who sin a lot will be judged a lot. Believers who live a life full of works and mercy and love will receive great reward. And believers who, uh, who don't do as much uh, who don't live uh, faithfully according to what Christ has called them to do, some of them will be saved as those barely escaping through the flames is the way that uh, Paul describes it in his letter to the Corinthians. So, uh, very results to the judgment, uh, but ultimately the, the biggest question is, do you know Christ? Have you received the gospel? Have you returned to Jesus? And if that's the case, then you are going to fall into this category. You will be judged as a believer, and you will receive reward according to what your, what your life has looked like. Even the people that are saved as one escaping through the flames, it will still be glorious and heaven will still be wonderful. Uh, but there will be greater reward for people who have been more faithful and, and done more works and, and those kinds of things too. So, Yeah, Ben? So what do you say to the guy, because I know a couple, <laughs> who say, oh, I don't care if I'm a potato peeler in heaven as long as I'm there. What, what do you say to that guy? I say, well, it's a, that's good at one level because yeah. you. I'm glad that you see the importance of making it to heaven and not to hell. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good start. Um, I, I, look at, I, yeah. I think that's kind of dangerous to, to have that mentality. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think there's some hard issues going on there. And I would say, why do you, why do you feel content just... Yeah. I uh, refusing to obey Christ's commands. Why? Why do you think that when He tells you to live a life so that He can tell you, "Well done, good and faithful servant," you say, "No, nah, no thanks. I'm not. I'm not big on that. I, as long as I get out of hell, I'm. I'm good." Yeah, so it seem, motives, seems seems like yeah. There's some heart issues and some motives going on there. Another thing that I would say is point to the glory that I uh, is promised mm -hmm. to those who uh, do live the way that Christ calls us to. And the, and the reward is promised. And it's something, it's a goal to work for and to strive for. It's supposed to be a motivating factor. So it's not like it's gonna be unimportant. It's not like the, the reward is going to be uh, meaningless or just uh, just a show, like no, no big deal. Like we just spray painted some chrome rims on your car. You know, spray, chrome rim spray paint. Like no big, dif no big difference there. Yeah. You know, okay. kind of a chintzy upgrade. Bondo fender. Yeah, yeah. It's like, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be a, a serious, uh, serious reward that that Christ has given to those who are faithful to Him, and it's going to be worth everyone who's lost families and fields and treasures on earth. Jesus is going to, He's going to repay them uh, many times over in heaven. Because this first question from a few weeks ago. We didn't talk about it, but I was—I left. I don't know. There's something didn't sit right with me. It wasn't your answer. It's just the word "judged" to me it seems like that's a bad thing. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So yeah. just naturally, I, I see that, and I'm like cringing, like I'm, I'm, I'm going to be judged. I thought yeah. Jesus was judged for me. You know. Yeah. Well, we talked a couple weeks ago about how that can have the neutral yeah. sense of evaluation, yeah. or it can mean condemnation. Sure. Mm. Um, so, and that, and that's the difference here. Unbelievers will be judged as in condemned. Yeah. Believers will be judged as in evaluated. That's something to think about.
So that, that word can be used in both ways, and it's used in different ways. Because we're going to be judged. How, how can we be judged, but then also help in judgment? That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we go first. Maybe yeah. we're, we're first in line, and then we <laughs> turn around and help judge the angels. Yes, that's really cool. I'm going to go read that. That's cool. So, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word tonight. And we pray that things have been made more clear rather than, than less clear. And we thank you for refining our understanding. And I thank you for refining my understanding of your word uh, through studying for this question tonight. And uh, God, help us to continue to grow and continue to learn and understand. And we're, th we're thankful for those opportunities to do that. So bless us uh, in, our, in our pursuit of you through your word. May your Holy Spirit be at work in our hearts to not only know your word, but to obey it and uh, empower your servants as we go out into the world and our mission fields this week. And we ask it in Jesus' name.